Elias Patterson says he wants to be a difference maker. You know who else would like to see him be a difference maker? Uh, the Vancouver Canucks teammates, Rick Tockett, the Vancouver Canucks fans, and possibly Farhan Lalji, who is joined by Ryan Bashog <laughs> right now in Vancouver. He just Guys, wants him to be good Patterson's in the scrums. Gonna get, just give him more than one word one. answers. More than one word <laughs> answers for Farhan. That's all he asks. You know, I'll be nicer next time. Farhan, I love. I love I love the way you went out of Farhad where you said so what are you going to do differently and Pedersen was at a loss for words so I guess Rick Tockett's got some ideas of maybe finding a way to get him off the schneid in tonight's game five. Yeah, it's been a tough playoff for Elias Pettersson, and really we've seen that through the regular season, and certainly you could see the emotion and anguish on his face at what he's dealing with in yesterday's press conference. And, you know, both Pettersson and Tockett were asked by me specifically about whether or not he, he needs to get some help, right? And I know that seems pretty counterintuitive for a guy that's going to get paid $11.6 $11. million complimentary center. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's kind of where we're at right now, and no one wants to cop to any kind of an injury or anything like that, so... Uh, you know, Talkin said yesterday, and, and even Pedersen said, yeah, that might be part of it, although he did take some ownership and say that he needed to do more. And what was surprising is that Talkin also said yesterday he was not going to touch his top two lines because he's really happy with the way the Miller line and the Lindholm line had been playing. Well, guess what? He has touched that second line, and Elias Lindholm and Elias Pedersen are now going to be line mates with Petey on the wing and Nils Hoaglander put back into the lineup. So, um, you know, that's certainly going to be a different look for them. You know, they haven't necessarily played Elias and Elias together a lot this season. Hoaglander has played quite a bit with Pedersen. He had 24 goals during the regular season, all at 5-on-5, five five, uh, but he's been a healthy scratch the last two games because there's been some elements of his game talk it hasn't been enamored with. So, Players like uh, Ilya Mikheyev, out. Sam Lafferty, out. So he threatened some changes. He's lived up to that. Vasily Podkolzin will play in his first ever NHL playoff game. But right now, the Canucks' top nine is set up a little bit more robustly. So there's no excuses to get some production out of the middle six. So the middle six, Gino, I'm telling you, the, the second a third line shows up and starts contributing will be a massive shift in this series because that's how tight it is, right? The top guys are taking their turns, firing their salvos back and forth. At some point, a third line is going to have to check into this series. So for the Oilers, that's Corey Perry, that's Ryan McLeod, and that's Warren Fogle. They got to do a better job of getting to the middle of the ice. Corey Perry's doing what he can. Those other two are two of the fastest skaters the Oilers have. They need to spend more time in the tough areas. They've been perimeter players, and they need to figure out that this is playoff hockey, get to the middle of the ice, and get a little bit ugly. It's something that Ryan McLeod doesn't necessarily come naturally for him, but it's playoff time. A third line is an absolute must. Stanley Cup champions have great third lines, and neither of these teams so far have displayed that at all, Gino. This blows me away, guys. We have been covering the Stanley Cup playoffs together for decades now. And when teams have a hard time scoring, we go, oh, that's because Carey Price or Roberto Luongo or somebody's standing on his head. We're talking about two goaltenders who are getting their first cracks at the postseason. Calvin Pickard at 32 becomes the oldest goalie in franchise history to get a playoff start for the Oilers, and he wins. I'm assuming Pickard gets in there again tonight. But can you believe that we're having this conversation about both these teams having a hard time scoring, and the two goalies right now are Calvin Pickard and Archer Seelox? Yeah, certainly take your point. I mean, wouldn't wouldn't have had that on the old bingo card <laughs> when the series started. Two guys that played against each other in the American They Hockey did, yeah, for sure year. they did. I mean... Yeah. Where Calvin Pickard is concerned, it is one of the better stories in the NHL this season, right? This guy just, you know, a career just completely resurrected, and he's beloved in that room. But like he said, you know, I don't want to just be a good guy in the room. I mean, he's not a cheerleader or a mascot here. Like, he's a player, and he said, I want to play good <laughs> hockey. And he is. He went in, and he played great for his team. He was steady, and he was solid. He's going to get another opportunity. This will be the first time he started back-to-back -back games all season long. So, yeah, it's a little bit crazy, but it is what it is. And uh, the goaltending on both sides has been a positive storyline, I would say, since Pickard has come in and obviously didn't go great with Stuart Skinner. Well, as far as he's concerned, as far as Pickard's concerned, I mean, he even admitted this morning that I didn't have, have a heavy workload in that last game because the Canucks were under 20 shots on goal, right? Vancouver's got to find a way to make it difficult for him, not stay on the perimeter for the first half of the game, get inside and get into some high danger scoring areas and, and just make it tough. I don't think they've done that yet. And you've got to give a certain amount of credit to Edmonton and their defense for that. But just for Vancouver, this team needs to start faster, especially at home. They had the one game in Edmonton in game three where they started well. They had a 3-1 lead after 
the first period. But in the other games, Edmonton has not only scored first. Vancouver hasn't managed more than five shots in any of those first periods. The Canucks scored first 52 times this season, Gino. They won 38 of those games. So they got to start faster and make it difficult for 60 minutes on Pickard, not just at the end when they're desperate. I'll make one point here on Pickard. If we go back to Stuart Skinner's last start, Gino, you'll remember two of the goals that were scored on him. He was standing there staring at Brock Besser, point-blank range with the puck on his stick, and Besser blew two great shots right past Stuart Skinner. He ends up not playing the next game. There was a moment in that last game, Calvin Pickard staring down Brock Besser right in the middle of the ice, exact same spots, and he made the save. And I was in the press box watching, and I looked at Farhan. We knew that was a big moment when one of the Canucks' best shooters. Now, it wasn't as nice a shot, but still, Pickard made the saves that he had to. And he's going to get another chance well, tonight. And, you know, we know this is your segment, but we're taking it over right now, talking goaltending. So as go far as where to go on Skinner, he's about a 600 save percentage on high glove. The Canucks need to go there. That's the weakness. You know, you talk about that Brock Besser shot. You put it there, it might be a different story instead of just kind of off to the side here. They need to be a little bit more deliberate with where they're going with the puck. I like the fact you're throwing in you a scouting report. You can have your show right? back. Give me a scouting report on this you, then. You, you, okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> Dry Seidel and McDavid won two in playoff scoring. No one's surprised there. Evan Bouchard rounds out the top three overall, and of course they're all three Oilers. But here's the here's the kind of shocker for me. Dry Seidel, eight goals so far. Bouchard's got four goals so far. Connor McDavid, two. Here's the question for both of you. Is it a bad thing that McDavid is still second in the playoff scoring and only has two goals? Or does it make him that much more dangerous because that leaves the Canucks wondering? How do we defend against this? Because if he shoots, he scores. If he doesn't shoot, he passes. And then we can't stop whoever's pass, whoever gets the pass. Okay. Here's my thought on McDavid. Last season, right. he changed the way he played and decided, I'm just going to become one of the best scorers on the planet now. And he did that. Scored 64 times, right? La-di-da. Decided to do it, and he did it. This season, he came back and completely changed his game and you know had 100 assists. So, but it changed the way fundamentally, night in, night out, he was thinking the game. You go back to his playoffs last year, Gino, 12 games, 8 goals. He was scoring big time in the playoffs last year. He changed the way he's processing and thinking the game. And far be it from us. I mean, he's Connor McDavid, right? The best offensive player on the planet. But here's my submission, Gino. Agree, disagree. The Edmonton Oilers need last year's Connor McDavid in this year's playoffs. Goal scoring is so important in the playoffs. They need McDavid thinking the game the way he did last year, right now. And you talk about those two goals, that's the difference in the way he's thinking the game. Well, let's take it a step further in terms of this series. After he was shotless for the first time in his playoff career in Game 1, he was shot out of a cannon in Game 2. He played like he played last year. But, you know, the Canucks have contained him a little bit because other than Game 2, in the other three games, he's combined for just two points, only one of those at 5-on-5, five five, just one point in the last game. The Canucks have done a very good job against Connor McDavid in three of the four games. They've got to feel good about how they're playing, especially now that the McDavid dry side of line has been split up. So you got to make hay because at some point, Connor McDavid's going to have his. And if he has another one of these kind of good but not great nights, the Canucks need to find a way to win because he's going to put his fingerprints back on this series. It's only a matter of time. Guys, as we look ahead to tonight's Game 5, we do so with a heavy heart. Of course, we lost a very dear friend and colleague in Darren Detition. All three of us have worked with him at multiple different levels over the last couple of decades. Uh, let me give you guys this opportunity to share some, some thoughts and some memories of your time with Darren Detition. Ryan, why don't you start? Yeah, well, one of the first chances I had to uh, really get to know Dutch, he w was here in Vancouver, and I, I was checking in to the Wall Center yesterday, and I was actually thinking about him. And this is before I'd heard the news because this is where we were staying in 2011. And it was the first time I had a really good chance to have a long chat with him. One of the first things he said to me was, you know, he was so complimentary. He said, we're so happy to have you on our team, man. You do great work. Like, that was the thing about Dutchy, like larger than life and the best there was at it. But he wasn't afraid to tell other people what he thought of them and how, you know, he shared that. And that meant a tremendous amount to me. And, you know, Edgar Renneria home runs, uh, the absolute best call ever. <laughs> You know, and, and I, I'd rather laugh because I don't want to cry, but I go back to uh, when we had the Western Broadcast Center opened early in my career at TSN from uh, 97 to, to 99, and I co-hosted a show 
with Dutch. We, you know, we had a host in Vancouver and a host in Toronto. And he gave it to me because I got my intros in too late. Here I am, rookie anchor, and he gave it to me. But then the next day he called me back, right? And he's just like, hey, man, listen, didn't mean to be so hard on you. And, you know, and it was it was all good. It was over instantly. And, you know, we built a really good relationship after that moment. And I saw him at Grey Cup a couple of years ago, and he was dealing with, with what he was dealing with. But, you know, it, it was in in kind of a good place at that time. And just to see him, he was still jacked, fresh out of the weight room, you know. And the Dutch that we saw on camera is the Dutch that we saw in real life. Yeah. And just a, a larger-than-life presence. It's a tremendous hole at TSN. Just loved the guy because he was so authentic. There could never be another Dutch, even if somebody tried and to I'll, be. And I'll, I'll say this, you know, being from in and around the Edmonton area, like, we knew Dutch before the rest of the country knew Dutch. His days at ITV, doing that 30-minute show at night, Perry Solkowski was his partner. They revolutionized the way that you would sit there and, and articulate a highlight pack. He was a legend in our town before the nation got the look at him that they got at him. Just larger than life even back then in his younger days. I'm Darren Detitian. Glad you tuned in. <laughs> Guys, well said. Thank you very much for sharing your memories. Uh, a legend, and he leaves a huge hole in our hearts and in our future of our network. Thank you guys so much for this. And a reminder to our viewers, you could see a tribute to Darren Detitian here on YouTube and also tonight on SportsCenter.